there are a lot of things that producers do. Like I said, a lot of my ideas come from their questioning me and some of the ideas and solutions come from what they're doing at their farm, right? So they, they do a lot of good things there. However, they cannot really tell if it's working or not because the data to analyze it, it's not well, like you put it in their records, right? So uh, for those of like the progressive dairy, dairy people, just think about like being very active on having good records because then they could do some of this, uh, create some of those answers on their own. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on when you're connecting. Uh, Mark Thomas here, the Dairy Podcast Show, and uh, happy to uh, present to you this morning, Luciano Cachetta uh, from the University of Minnesota. Uh, Luciano is a close friend and colleague, uh, known him since his uh, Cornell days back in New York, and it's a pleasure to have him connecting uh, with us today. Good morning, Luciano. Good morning, Mark, and uh, uh, to all of you listening to the podcast. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to come here and uh, uh, share with you some of the things that we're doing and ideas we have and just chat a little bit about dairy. Excellent. Excellent, Luciano. Um, we connected just a bit before. It's uh, pretty darn cold in, in, in uh, Minnesota right now, I hear, and I know my colleagues up in, in, in Canada, Calgary, it's even colder. But uh, fortunately, I'm here in Torreon and uh, the locals think it's it's cold. Um, but uh, it's, it's pretty moderated. So uh, a, a good day to be inside uh, recording a podcast. Oh, yeah, that's true. Like yesterday I was outside uh, on a project in the farm and uh, it was brutal. Uh, I have a team at the farm. Every, like They're there today. So just told them, like, be safe. Uh, keep your hands and toes warm. Don't lose any any fingers. Uh, keep the good work. And like... You, you well know, like we have a, a grad student here that's from Torreon that uh, was a connection with you and he left, right? Good timing to go back to, to home for Christmas and he missed all this fun that we're having here now. Yes, he's, he's back here now. Uh, he, uh, uh, he's been to the office a few times now. And, and uh, Noel, uh, <clears throat> my, my daughter was fortunate enough to do a project with Whitney Nauer and, and, and Luciano and his team. Uh, last year, uh, but in Wisconsin during the winter, uh, in in calf hutches. So they they have I, I got some pretty pretty interesting pictures some mornings as they were working in the snow and cold. So um, Luciano, uh, you have a, a interesting background, uh, you know, from your roots in in Brazil. Um, can you give the uh, the audience a bit of a introduction of, of where you're from, how you became interested in, in dairy, and uh, you know how you got to where you are today at the university. Yeah, no, that's good. So yeah, like you mentioned, I'm, I'm from Brazil uh, and I did my vet school training in Brazil. Uh, I moved to the US in 2020, 2007, yeah, 2007. Uh, and I uh, I got involved with vet medicine and dairy, not dairy, but cattle production uh, since an early age. Uh, my father is also a veterinarian who works with uh, mostly beef in Brazil, a lot of nutrition and reproductive management on large uh, large farms. And then during vet school, the one thing I knew when I got into vet school is that I didn't want to do small animal medicine. I knew that. And through my training, I always thought I would be a consultant. Uh, consultant, and that's what I was planning on. Till one day, when I was doing some research, uh, my uh, PI in Brazil, my mentor uh, asked me if I had interest in going, coming to the US uh, and learning something new, but it has to be dairy, not beef. And it's like, well, I'll take it, I'll go. And that's when I came to Cornell in 2007 uh, to work with Dr. Gilbert in the, with metritis. That's at that time, I was very focused on reproduction. And many of you might know there's a lot of Brazilians in the US here working with reproduction. So I was on that. Uh, sort of that group. Uh, they came work in this lab uh, during my last year of vet school, went back home, graduated, and came back to Cornell and started working with Dr. Bicalio, mostly in lameness at that time. So it was already a little bit different. And after that, I, I enrolled into the residency in uh, ambulatory clinic and dairy production medicine there. 
And that's when I really uh, changed my focus of research and what I was doing from reproduction to uh, metabolic diseases and animal uh, management, uh, their cow management. Because as a re uh, resident, like we were out there doing everything all the time, being on call, and I got tired of treating the same diseases over and over again and seeing the same problems in different farms. And we tried to work with farmers. Uh, and once we work and show data, good research, they make changes and we decrease. For example, if we're dealing with a DA, we make changes and we have fewer DAs. So I decided to work on that, which was, if you think about job security for veterinarians, uh, that's not what we want, right? Like, well, in the old days, we want to have more cows to fix. And then I decided to go on the, uh, uh, preventing all those uh, diseases from happening. Uh, that's when I enrolled in the PhD, completed a PhD at Cornell. Then after that, kind of like in between and after the two years of uh, teaching at Colorado State University before moving here to University of Minnesota uh, five years ago. Um, and since then, since that point, when I started doing clinics and seeing that repro is a good repro is a consequence of good management and good this good health i decided to go on this down like upstream from the repro results and go on like delivering healthy cows and cows they'll be more likely to get pregnant to the repro people and got away from like working with repro physiology and that so that's where i'm at and that's where i'm focused uh, on my research program Luciano, that's a, a great background and, <clears throat> and obviously that path of really knowing, you know, on farm, not only with the veterinarians, but with the, the herd health staff and on farm veterinarians are, are having to do and feeling um, <clears throat> when they see, uh, you know, a sick cow and, and really driving that prevention strategy. Um, I think one thing I've also been really impressed with over the years, and, and we've had the opportunity to collaborate on quite a number of projects, is the, the practicality. Of, of your research, right? And, and and lots of research eventually gets to some practical outcome, some doesn't, um, but you know, the projects you're doing, really those results directly can impact the decision um, today. And, and just listen to, you know, another one of your podcasts uh, from AABP um, and, uh, you know, have you heard podcast series and, and talking about the, uh, 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 boba calc dry and you know that research directly leads to okay this is something i can take home and do um so with that you know your 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 projects are, are varied very practical but um highlight some of your your past and current research and and you know some of the those take home items that the audience can uh potentially you know today think about and say gee is this something we can implement on our dairy and obviously it doesn't always require the use of a, of a product. A lot of times it's a management strategy. Um, I think, you know, some of your work looking at uh, the the uh, effect of ketosis at different days in milk on, on future outcomes, that's really important, right? Because some herds spend a lot of time testing for ketosis and maybe um, those herds can fine tune when they look for that disease if, if the result doesn't really have a downstream outcome. Yeah, so uh, I'll just kind of go in the order that you mentioned there. I'll, do, I'll talk about the both cock dry and the citogenic bolus that bolus uh, research that we've done uh, last summer, and it's coming out. Publications are coming out soon because we are we submitted them, and it now is just the review process that's what we're waiting on. But that one and all the other things that you mentioned of my research, like you, you said, is very applicable. So a lot of my research questions come from conversations with producers and conversations with practitioners. Like we talk about what's happening, we see the problem. Uh, sometimes producers are doing really interesting things at the farm that there's no data behind it at that point, but we, those are things that are uh, worth um, exploring. So the bovicalc dry, and this acidogenic bolus uh, idea uh, at dry off, it's not new. It's something that the company who owns the, the product uh, have done some research of that in, back in Europe where it's produced. But I had in the past worked a lot of calcium. Uh, and when I saw that product coming out, it's like, well, that's very interesting. And I reached out to the company and said, like, 
she's like, what, what are you doing? Uh, uh, what's this project project about? And then through conversations, we came up with ideas that uh, would answer some questions that farmers have and also answer questions that the company have because, again, it's owned by a company, so there is a marketing potential for them. But I came into that collaboration with them to look into, uh, can we do something to make cows better after dry off, right? But I mean, by better, I mean like uh, more comfortable, for example. So we all see uh, through the years, uh, the NMC, the National Science Council have put out like very good uh, parameters and standard operating procedures to get cows to have good other health afterwards at, on the next lactation. Uh, but what we see now is like we are starting to see we don't need to treat all the cows so we can go with selective dry cow therapy. But there's also the fact now that, yes, we want to do selective dry cow therapy, but I have really high producing cows that I don't feel comfortable on letting them just dry off uh, on their own and like not put any antibiotics to prevent it. So because we have all these cows producing a lot of milk, uh, we have to have different strategies to make those cows more comfortable or decrease their milk production by the time that uh, they dry off. So uh, with that in mind, that's how we came up and this collaboration with the uh, uh, Boringa Ingerheim uh, to study this uh, pill that they have, this endogenic bolus, to decrease that new production at dry off. And hopefully, by decreasing that, will decrease uh, their pressure, uh, their leakage, and then consequently looking to um, better their health. So, in Europe, in their previous studies, they show that those things are there. So, you, you provide them with a endogenic bolus, they'll decrease uh, their uh, pressure, decreased leakage, and that's it. They got to that point. And then here, what we did, we enrolled 900 cows, uh, randomized trial, 450 in each side, in each group. And then we're looking into their other uh, health postpartum. Uh, so what we saw was uh, many cows, uh, men, uh, fewer cows who have mastitis, clinical mastitis on the cows that receive the pseudogenic bolus, and you have a decrease in somatic cell count in the first two tests for those cows that receive a pseudogenic bolus. So this treatment, this administration of this product at dry off has an impact later on. And in one, in one group, to touch on that welfare that I, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, in one farm we had access to um, activity and rumination data, and we looked into that and we saw that the cows uh, who had the cows that had uh, received the bolus, they had a lower activity. And in this case, because of the way the, the system was measuring, lower activity means that they are lying down more. Uh, it's a, a double negative in this case, but we saw those cows, they, they were lying down more. And so likely more comfortable, right? <laughs> likely more comfortable, yeah. And then the question that I have is like, but they could also be lying down more if they're sick or they're not feeling well. And that's when we uh, come with the data for the rumination help us to show that that's not because they were feeling they were sick because their rumination was the same on both groups. So uh, it's mostly likely because they're more comfortable. So unfortunately this, we didn't have like 900 cows on that study. We only had 80. So the data could be better if you had uh, more cows, be more precise on our estimates, but uh, that that's what we found, and it was it's not was not an incidental finding, but it wasn't the main objective. So that's why we didn't. It's not as powerful as it could be, just because our main objective was to determine and show the other health uh, differences, which are also there. So um, that's what we did. And again, this is also a practical question that uh, I get from producers and veterinarians on a regular basis. Like, what do I do with my high producing cows? Can we do something to make them better, right? So Luciano, have you had the opportunity to look at the economics of that at all in terms of, obviously on the somatic cell count side, it would vary 
depending on the co-op and, and premiums paid for cell count. But on the clinical mastitis side, that would be a little uh, more clear. Um, have you looked at that at all yet? Or? Yeah, so we actually worked with an ag economist here at the University of Minnesota uh, on looking into that. So we did a partial budget analysis uh, using uh, the increased input cost by having to add the, the both copyright uh, administration uh, and then we other inputs that went on the the, the calculations were uh, milk production and milk prices that were calculated based on the region and the farm um, and the time of the year uh, uh, the uh, cow cow costs or revenue were there feed costs were there divided by uh, dry fresh cows and uh, high producing. And then we look into those 900 cows we had, we look through entire lactation. Also, uh, as you mentioned, clean mastitis cost, uh, only direct cost uh, that we were able to capture. Like it, it's really hard to determine that indirect cost of that clean mastitis, but we put there like the antibiotic treatment, the milk uh, withholded, like the five days of milk that we uh, uh, didn't deliver plus labor associated to that. And then overall on the four farms we have, uh, there was about uh, assuming a $15 cost for bovicoc dry, we had a $40 to $43 um, positive, that positive for the bovicoc dry, uh, bovicoc dry group. So we had this almost three to one return on investment uh, to a point that um, the ag economist, uh, once she got the results, she, she contacted me. It's like, uh, I'm very excited about those results because this is the first time that I do a economic analysis for a company that it goes the way the company actually ex expected it to go. Uh, and which was a good, like, it was a good result. Uh, but there is also a lot of variation things that we're investigating now is why it's different in herds. So the, the four herds we have. There is a difference between the herds, uh, and we're trying to tease out what are the factors leading to one herd being very uh, profitable and other herd not being profitable at all. So those are the things we have to tease out. It becomes very hard to get those answers because now we are working with even fewer animals, and then it's hard to, to tell. But again, yeah, it's, it's small numbers in different herds. so. But it's still it's there, and the population the population we used it was profitable. So uh, that's also a first for me to have uh, a result that is like this clear cut. Usually it's not that that far ahead for for a, a profitable for a product when we are testing. And again, I just like to make a disclaimer: like I have uh, no ties with with the company that sells the bolos, it's just the results we got were, were super exciting. Great, and I think two things there, Luciano. Um, one is what you just said, the importance of independent and, and then peer-reviewed uh, research, right? That, that's so important. Um, we know there's public publication bias in, in, um, in journals today, and, and uh, you know a lot of what we see has some beneficial results, so it's great when we have those uh, results, but also the economics. And then on that, you know, thank you, because so many times we see uh, results and yes, okay, the, the product works, that's great, but what is the economic benefit? You know, if, it, if the cost uh, uh, supersedes the, uh, the, the benefit, well then that's great, but what do we do with that information from, from the dairy side, okay? Um, and those are become difficult questions because then if there's some welfare component in there, you know, how do you put a tangible value on, okay, that cow is more comfortable. I mean, ultimately we have to show some economic benefit to that, but we, we, we can't forget the welfare side either. Yeah, no, it is, it's interesting because, uh, and I'm not a welfare researcher at all, but I understand the value of it. And the welfare, the fact that the cows like was lying down for a little longer, it's not a huge amount, but they were allowed lying down for a little longer. It was like, to me, it was the most exciting uh, result from 
all the things that we have. And we have like very economically tangible numbers there, like with decreased mastitis, we improve uh, other health. But to be still like knowing that we're making cows more comfortable, uh, it, it's more valuable, even though I cannot put a number to it, right? Like, I, I, I just really like that idea that we're doing something to make them more comfortable, uh, especially in dry off, which was on the dry period when there's a lot of, for many years, people didn't really pay attention to it. And now we're getting to know how good it is when we invest on those animals. Right? Yeah. I think the other, the other exciting part would be, you know, looking at some of Lance Bombard's research and, and, and some of his hypotheses um, of inflammatory responses at dry off causing transition metabolic disease, you know, 45, 50 days later, and somewhat relating that to is, is there inflammation related to utter fill, that, that pressure, that then downstream, you know, at freshening affects that cow. So I think, you know, it's exciting to think of, okay, the effect on clinical mastitis, and cell count, kind of makes sense, right? You know, that cow's not leaking and so forth. Um, even line time makes a bit more sense too. Okay, you know, we all have seen, you know, cows maybe the day after dry off or so that look uncomfortable, right? So I, I think then now taking that, um, you know, some of Lance's work and, 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 and the next step is that affecting ketosis and, and energy balance and, and, and other transition uh, diseases. So, uh, you know, cool area for further research too. Yeah, and I think that it has it ties really well and also what I do. So if I were to divide my lab to there's two main things that we're working on is mastitis and this dry off management comes within it. We also have uh, a project funded by USDA working to immuno e stimulants to try to treat mastitis or prevent mastitis using non antibiotic products. But the other area that I do is the metabolic and mostly uh, ketosis work, uh, as you mentioned before, and I think that will tie in very well into it. Uh, and like you mentioned, Lance, and that's something that uh, I share some some similar thoughts with him uh, on the fact that I think the two of us agree that ketosis is not a disease. Like I, I'll, I would agree to call it a disorder, but I, I want the, the I don't they're not always a disease, right? Like we definitely have ketotic cows, they're sick. Like you have those down cows, they're chewing on everything. They definitely need some treatment, but not all cows would be ketotic. Just because they have high BHP doesn't mean that they're in trouble, right? Because that's something that uh, you alluded to early on on other research that I've been doing uh, on the ketosis, ketosis realm of my research. Uh, that's one of the things that we're working on is like just trying to uh, show or <laughs> whichever way you want to call it that not just because a cow has a high BHP, she'll be in trouble, right? So there are two papers that came out 2021, I believe, uh, or early 2022 from our group showing the first one is just showing uh, that not all high BHP uh, is a problem for cows. Uh, what we looked into that is like, um, since we don't have a definition of a uh, healthy cow, we use like a high producing cow or high, produ high production being our proxy for health. So we divide our cows into high and low producing cows and BDU cows. So we divided them on the top 25% bottom and the middle 50 as your medium cow. Uh, and we then look into those different groups, if a cow had high BHB or not, what the problems were, and making a very long story very short, is a cow that have high BHB and she's producing well, uh, she produces, she has uh, the same number of this, they're the same risk of having diseases, being living the herd, and same reproductive performance as cows that do not have high BHP. So what's telling us and what we are seeing there, just putting scientific numbers behind is like, if a cow is producing well or she's healthy and have a high BHP, she might not be in trouble. Uh, she might not be a problematic cow. Uh, 
On the other hand, when we look in, on the bottom 25%, those cows do perform way worse than the cows that don't have high PHP. So this was good for us to come back to producers and to practitioners and tell and show, talk to them, say, if you have cows, they're high producers, do not just go locking them up to check for BHB because you might be harming them more than benefiting them by finding those three or four cows that have high BHB and giving them propylene glycol for three days. So you're locking them up for three days in a row and you're losing that much milk too, right? So those are good questions. That, like I said, those questions come from producers. We go to farms and they're checking cows, BHB, all fresh cows uh, at a given day or twice a week, whatever is the protocol. And they said like finding a lot of cows with high BHB, but they look just fine. They're producing the most. What do I do? It's like, I don't think you need to, to check for BHB. Usually what I tell them is like, I would use BHB in two ways. One is if I want to measure or monitor how my cows are transitioning and they're doing like a weekly or every other week, 12 or 15 cows on your herd to see do I have a lot of high BHPs or not. But the other way I do is like I have a sick cow, she is not producing a lot. I cannot find a DA or any of like very clear disease. Then I measure BHB and yes, you might have a clinical case of ketosis. And then those ones definitely benefit the most for the treatment. They actually need the treatment right away. The other ones, and you know, Mark, we talked about projects like this, like we still need to figure out if they would benefit or not. Like I don't have that question answered scientifically, but I have a gut feeling that maybe not all of them will benefit from it, but I cannot really assert it because I don't have data to support it. So, but that's, those are questions that producers have. Yeah, no, that, that's so relevant, Luciano. And as you describe this, I can't help but think back on probably 20 years now, and I'm going to age myself, but I recall one of our current clients, but really astute herd, herd manager. And, you know, those were the years where fresh cow programs were really in vogue, right? You know, you lock up every cow for the first 10 days and you take her temperature and you check her for ketosis and so forth. And, uh, you know, this herd manager was was re was doing urine uh, sticks for ketosis on, I, I forget now, but I, it, it may have been every cow for the first 10 days or something. And if she turned the stick purple, she got a bottle of dextrose. And, and you know, so ketosis in, in dairy comp was like super high, right? But it was these cows that when I was with him, I would look and their udder was full, they're chewing their cud. And uh, <clears throat> I kind of, I, you know, in that era, I went out on a limb and I said, don't treat these cows. I said, just watch them. I said, you're really good at looking at cows. I said, just don't do anything with them. And he looked at me, you know, like, like what? I said, if you have any DAs for the next two months, I will, I will do the surgery for free. I said, that's my deal, right? I just want, let's see what happens to these cows. And I remember like coming back like a week later for herd health and he'd be like, wow. He's like, like in two days, they all, they're, they're all negative. Like they just recovered. And I said, it's cause you guys do a great job, you know, uh, great cow comfort, feed access, cow cooling in the summer, so forth and so on. These cows, high producing cows ate their way through it, so to speak. And, but that changed dramatically the labor also. It's like, you know, as we know now, you know, let the lock her up if she needs to be locked up. So, um, one, that's cool and really relevant, but I think, again, another example of the practicality of, um, you know, let the cow be a cow, right? And, and let's intervene when we need to, but not over intervene, if you will, or, or, or subject those animals to, to unneeded treatments. Yeah, and then when, when I talk about those things, that there's one element on all this equation that you, you alluded to there. It is a good cow person on the barn with the cows, right? And I know how hard it is, especially when it's hard to find labor in general, but it's hard to have those. But if you have those good herd people there, take advantage of those. They, they are very good about, they, they're better than a stick, like telling you it's purple or not. Yes. Yeah. And now with, you know, with more herds, uh, installing or using activity monitoring, rumination monitoring. Now that's just the next step of how do we 
you know, find these cows early. And, but on the same token, you know, those systems may alert us, but so early that what, what do we do with some of these cases? Do they, do they need treatment either? Or, you know, so I think that there's still so much to learn there. And I'll say the other thing is, you know, again, just being open to um, the change, right, of admitting that what we did in the past was maybe not correct. And, and I can think back clearly as we talk about ketosis. Uh, again, I don't know how many years ago, a conversation with, with good friend and colleague, Mike Capel, and he told me, you know, he just treats ketosis with propylene glycol and, and a little bit of an argument. I'm like, oh, Mike, you got to give dextrose. He's like, oh, I don't give dextrose. Like, like is that bad? And I'm like, well, I think it is right. Like, and look at today now, you know, the, the research that's come <clears throat> from uh, Jess McCart's group, a uh, nice trial there looking at, you know, just glycol, uh, a single dose of dextrose, or I think multiple three days of dextrose and no benefit. Right. So um, I'm, I'm comfortable saying, yeah, I over treated lots of cows in my career um, that probably needed either nothing or, or, glycol for three days right so that's you know being being open to that new information and change is, is so important yeah well and i think that everyone should take that as a win right like uh I, I, another example that i have it's not ketotic ketosis related but like dry cow therapy right so whenever it was implemented we had to treat all the cows because the conditions are so bad that if you don't didn't treat you have mastitis problem now the 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 whole industry moves so far ahead that now we can decide or choose in many farms if you want to use it or not. So it's a win for the industry. The same way for this ketotic or how this BHP, maybe whenever we were back there treating all those cows is most of those high BHP were actually sick animals, but now we have better management, better diets, everything. Then like what we're doing is like we're making them produce so much more that they have to burn some of their fats and then naturally they'll have higher BHP. So it might be a consequence of our our own win. So we're just making them that much better, you know, quote unquote, but like just getting them, uh, we're not creating this problem, but it is uh, uh, something that's happening as a consequence of our good management. No, absolutely. And I think also, you know, the, the cow of today is a, is a bit different, right? She, she truly is, a, a, you know, even of five years ago, I think we need to look at, um, you know, some of the um, really early work with, with ketosis, BHB, uh, Paula Spina at Cornell, you know, with, with Daryl Nightum, and, and, and obviously you, you were part of some of that research. And, you know, that wasn't that many years ago, but it, was that cow actually genetically different um, that today we maybe can't 100% extrapolate all of that information or cut points, especially. Maybe we need to reset our cut points, right? Um, for what what is uh, subclinical, what is clinical ketosis? Yeah, that that's the thing. Like again, to that work that was done initially, uh, most of them like you had cows that were tested for BHP between three and 16 days in milk. Like that's usually how it was. So. It's, Two times a week in the first and second week. That's how things were done. You capture all of them. And that's the other thing that we looked at is like, does it matter when they we diagnose this? So we kind of split like arbitrarily, do they have high BHP in the first week versus the second week? And what we found is, yes, I was having high BHP, and this time we didn't separate if it all the types of BHP, like if it's bad or not, but like high BHP in the first week was associated with poor performance, uh, poor repro, less milk. But if they were diagnosed the second week, for example, that wasn't the case. So our hypothesis and something that we're still working on here is our working hypothesis, like those cows in the first week, high BHB, it's likely cows are not transitioning well. So it's and the consequence probably of poor uh, uh, health or physiology in the dry period and then they, they're not, they are not ready to produce, and they just crash, right? And the second week cows are those cows that yes, they transition well. They did a likely a fantastic first week in milk, and now they're producing a lot of milk, and then they're burning their fat to produce to support that milk that they're doing, right? So the first and second week, uh, it's very important, and I felt really validated on that 
uh, a few weeks ago when Dr. Jessica McCart contacted me via text and said, like, I just looking at my old data from those original work and I look into first and second week and like I see a similar pattern that you described in your paper. So it was very uh, reassuring to me to see that uh, the, the pattern and this difference was there. It's just that we were still learning at that point and we didn't look into different ways, right? But now, again, it's another win for the whole industry is we are just moving ahead and we're learning a little by bit by bit and moving forward. And now we're just fine tuning those things that we thought we knew, which we kind of knew, but we are fine tuning and like having better answers and uh, research data to support that. So again, very applicable, right? Yeah. And that's what's so cool about that data, right? Is that that information today can lead what a dairy veterinarian or herd, herd manager, herd owner is going to do with their cow. So, you know, changing perhaps the strategy of when they, when they, or if they check uh, BHBA. Um, <clears throat> I think it, it goes hand in hand of, you know, not all too long ago, um, many practitioners and, 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 and industry folks too, were taking blood samples at calving to look at blood calcium levels, right? And making decisions based on that and of a, of a DCAD program working or not, or, or what have you. And we now know that, you know, there, there's no correlation between at calving calcium and, and future reproductive or, and or production. And actually subclinically, hypocalcemic cows are your highest producers, right? It's actually the opposite. So I think that's really exciting is, you know, it's really important to use first principles in our knowledge, but don't over interpret what we think we know because we don't know, right? You know, hypocalcemia is bad at calving. Well, you know, my, we, we, we have to really investigate that further and think that through, right? Yeah. Yeah, during my time at Cornell, one of my PhD uh, work was uh, looking to uh, subclinical hypocalcemia in the first three days in lactation. Uh, actually working with Dr. Uh, Capo uh, and one of his, uh, his client there is there. Uh, at that time in New York, it was a lot of low uh, uh, potassium, but no decaf diets. So it was prime time for us. Like today, we cannot do that because a lot of farms would be a decaf, uh, thank you, decaf diets. At that point, we did it uh, no negative decaf diets, just low uh, uh, potassium. But we, like, in the, I remember my data has for for the multi parent cows, 96% of them had lower than the cutoff for uh, calcium levels. So at that point, I started looking like if I have 96% of my cows, I consider abnormal. Like, is it really abnormal? Which is good because then like later on, you see all this data coming out. It's like probably that's not the best time for you to measure calcium. If you were to measure calcium and define what's your subclinical hypocalcemia problem, that calving you're going to think you have a much bigger problem than you actually have. Yes. Yeah. And now what's interesting is as the uh, more of the data becomes available with uh, the calcium uh, minders, um, for example, such, such as Excellent and, and Protect is one of the sponsors, actually, of the Dairy Podcast Show. But, you know, the, uh, some of that data shows higher calcium levels at calving. So now what is what does that mean? Right. Is that uh, and, and those are some of the things that we still need to investigate further. Yeah, because I picked up, I saw a, a note from it yesterday, but Dr. McCart also just put out a short communication on JDS, which is uh, available for everyone. It's open access. And they were looking into day four in milk and the production. And uh, they're seeing like some of this, uh, um, the same effects. They're saying like having a day one might. Not that in that project they saw that, but they're showing that if they're delayed or have high hypocalcemia later on, that's usually the worst ones. Like those are the cows that they definitely didn't adapt well uh, and they're crashing, right? And then if they crash, then consequently lower milk production, poor repro, more likely to leave the herd, other diseases will happen, and then you just have that train wreck of a cow. Yes, yeah. No, Luciano, these are, this, this, is, this is super exciting, and, and uh, we, we could probably go on for, for quite a bit of time here and, and, and talk about lots of topics, but I, I think we've, we've brought to the audience here um, 
a great opportunity to think outside of the box, right? Traditional concepts of disease, ketosis, hypocalcemia, um, and then what we can do to support that high producing cow, uh, you know, through her through her dry transition period, um, I, I think are all some areas that are really practical. And like you said, questions that come up um, for the for the dairy or for dairy practitioners on a uh, dairy industry professionals on a regular basis. Yeah, uh, like I said to you earlier, just a little uh, one point that I just thought of. It could be good because we have a lot of producers listening. So. There are a lot of things that producers do. Like I said, a lot of my ideas come from their questioning me and some of the ideas and solutions come from what they're doing at their farm, right? So they, they do a lot of good things there. Uh, however, they cannot really tell if it's working or not because the data to analyze it, it's not well, like you put it in their records, right? So uh, for those of like the progressive dairy, dairy people, just think about like being very active on having good records because then they could do some of this, uh, create some of those answers on their own and their own system, right? Because not everything that works for everyone, but they might have a solution that's really good for them. And if they have this good system on recording that data set, and there's plenty of people I know, uh, you, Mark, work a lot of a lot of producers on having good systems on re her, uh, record keeping, that's very helpful for them because they can answer specific questions on their own system and tell if it's work or not. And that, that's un unvaluable. Like that's something that will cost them very little, but they can bring a lot of revenue to the farm. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, 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 you know, we're, we're huge proponents of, of on-farm research and data when done, when uh, data collection, when done correctly. So, so that's great. And I think really important for the, for the audience. Um, and on the same token, be careful not to overinterpret that data that you see an effect or didn't see effect when actually it exists because we just didn't have, like you said, enough numbers or our control group. And I think that's what's you know so common um, of an error that we see of, of misinterpretation of the data. Yeah, and there is there is some uh, I know of some uh, practitioners that can help them. Like I don't. It depends on who who is your practitioner and who if they can help you or not, but there are resources. And I'm sure if they have some of those questions, extension agents or uh, university faculty in their area, I'll be happy to take calls and talk to people about those things uh, on my outreach uh, part of my effort, right? Uh, but there's that, like they could help and like they can, they can search for some help and uh, like the case of producer, even practitioners sometimes like would ask us for help to set up some trials. So I think it's it's valuable. Uh, some of the larger systems do their own research for their systems. So it is valuable and it's something that if you have a system that you can implement, it, it can be can bring a lot of revenue and can bring a lot of good answers to to each dairyman. Great. Person. Well, thank you, Luciano. And, and for those of you um, who have an interest in that, uh, just Google Luciano Cachetta's uh, name, University of Minnesota, and his, his uh, email will pop up and uh, hope emails start f uh, flowing into his inbox here. Yeah. And that becomes being too much and be slow, but I'll, I'll get back to you, everyone. <laughs> super, super. <clears throat> so Luciano, as we wrap up here, the, uh, the dairy podcast crew um, uh, has a few questions that we've been wrapping up with in a, in a routine basis. And, um, I guess uh, you know a little bit about your uh, some, some professional and some uh, outside of your professional career. But what, what's a dairy-related resource book reference that that you recommend to the audience? It's hard when you ask an academic, right? Because we're so like into our own things. That us like JDS is great because that's where I get all my my dairy uh, my dairy information. Uh, but some of the 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 publicly available magazines are. They they come up with really good uh, summaries of the what's coming out on the on the journals. Like I get contacted by them on a regular basis on some projects that papers that are coming out, so like helping them uh, um, write some summaries. And I have to put a plug here, like the uh, Dairy Cattle Reproductive Council, which is on the the treasure has for those involved and interested in. Me, 
reproduction has a really good, it's a really good resources on the reproductive side of things. Super, super. Yeah, and I would agree with those. I, th I think those are, uh, yeah, those would be my answers too. So, um, what about outside of dairy, outside of ag? Is there, is there something you're reading now or a favorite book or, 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 or something? It, it's, uh, so I know some of us spend too much, I always say I spend too much time reading professionally. I need to find some friend of mine the other day said, you got to read this book. I said, okay, we'll read it together. So it stimulate me to not always pick up JDS. Or... Yeah, have that accountability on doing that. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, audiobooks. So in the summer, I go through audiobooks very often because in the summer, I'm using it when I'm mowing my lawn. And in the winter, I'm shoveling or snow blowing almost every day, right? So in addition to my commute, I listen to a lot of books. So I usually try to go rotate like fictional and non-fictional uh, every once in a while, uh, every other book. I don't like I'm currently actually reading on paper copy. Uh, the, uh, I forgot the name, Gentleman Moscow or something like that. Um, but I listen to uh, it is it's, it's probably very nerdy uh, and probably not good for many people. But there's this. Uh, uh, science fiction um, series called Expeditionary Force, which is about like they're traveling to space and there's like a very uh, annoying AI that commands everything. Uh, it's pretty good. Like they're, I'm on book 15 of those. It's one of those that they come every six months, they have one out. So it's good for me to have this fiction and it's like a series that I'm listening to it all the time. So uh, that's what I've been listening, but most of the time, as a good Brazilian, it's a lot of soccer, uh, which I call it football, uh, um, and that's what it is. My my wife gets mad at me because the so the football season in Brazil starts in January and finishes in December, so she's always like, "You're watching soccer like twice a week all the long." Like, sorry, that's how it is. <laughs> Well, well, we could we could go on for quite a while after uh, Sunday's victory for the Argentinians, and that was a, a really exciting game for those of you who aren't uh, soccer or football fans. Uh, yeah, came into penalty kicks at the World Cup, and uh, yeah, so so that was a, a lot of activity. Uh, and I know some uh, have plenty of uh, Argentinian friends, um, mutual friends of Luciano and I, and I know some of them didn't even watch at the end because they said they would would have had a heart attack. So oh, I would have. I was I was watching it and I almost had a heart attack, and I'm not an Argentinian. As a Brazilian, French, yeah. Yeah. yeah, as a Brazilian, cool. Um, and I think Luciano, you're already on your own. The, the last question was, you know, what sets apart um, the, the leaders in the dairy profession, uh, herd managers, herd owners, uh, nutritionists, and anyone? And I think you already answered that. Is is uh, you know looking looking at the data and and using um, not only what you see, but the actual numbers. And I think that's, that's so important. Yeah. And also, I guess, caring for your animals. Right. And I know that all of us, like the majority of us in their industry really care. I think, uh, one thing that we need to be better now is just educating and showing people how much we do care for our animals. Uh, we, they're not machines to us. They, they are means to uh, to survivability, right? Like they, they generate revenue, but people care. Like they are numbered. Like if you go in a farm that has like, in my mind, like if I have more than 40 cows, I won't remember the name of all of them. That's why they have numbers, but they all individual. We can tell them individually. Uh, but I think what we need to we'll start setting even more apart leaders would be this ability to show people what agriculture is doing and we know that only i think that they say like two percent of population are involved with agriculture now and 98 percent are not but they're eating what we produce uh having that capability of telling them like this is what we're doing that's the reason we're doing and this is how much we care for the animals like everybody that comes on the farm they 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 can see this it's uh, people really love their 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 animals and yes, there's some bad apples, some bad actors that show up once in a while, but that's definitely not the norm. So I think that's also important for for us. And I, I'm always happy because I deleted social media from my phone for a break now, but like 
I follow a bunch of those uh, ag related uh, accounts and it's I, I'm really happy to see how they're portraying it and showing them what's happening and uh, trying to educate the younger generation. So I think that's a uh, uh, very important for for us in the future. No, I thoroughly agree. And yeah, reach out, take that opportunity when you're on an, on a plane or, or you know in a restaurant or any any public place and, and, and engage with people. And I find when I travel a fair bit. I, I've had some of the best conversations of sitting there bringing up pictures of dairy farms and cows and uh, a free stall or or a dry lot deep bedded pack and say this this is where your milk comes. You know. Um, you don't have to stop eating dairy, right? So, <clears throat> no, super, super point, Luciano. Excellent. Well, um, <clears throat> really appreciate your time today, especially just before the holidays. Um, you, you mentioned that graduate student from from Torreon. He just walked into the office, and um, I see he's working. I think you told me he should be taking vacation. So good, good to see he's uh, right across from you, uh, working away. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll kick him out of here soon, and. Uh, uh, you have a great holiday with your, your family, and uh, we, uh, we look forward to more research and, and, and data from, from you and your team. Yeah, well, thanks for the invitation. Uh, uh, happy holidays to you and to all this, to all, everyone listening. If they listen before holidays, if they listen after it, like, I hope they have a ho happy holiday and they're staying warm, whatever they are. <laughs> great. Thanks, Luciano. Thank you.